Welcome, everyone. My name is Frédéric Passeron, and I'm very happy to welcome you to this new Munch and Learn session. Today, we'll be talking about accelerating scientific research through high-performance computing democratization. The two main speakers will be Andrew Shaw and Scott Beckman. So before we start, I have to go through very quickly because of the issue we encountered before through a few housekeeping items. So can you move to the next slide, please? Yep. So the Munch and Learn series occurs on a monthly basis. These are, I would say, thought leadership, vendor agnostic, product agnostic type of sessions. Uh, next month, we'll be hosting a session on quantum computing insights from HPE Labs. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary engineering, and TAMO is not an option. And I have to look it up for TAMO, which means then a miracle cure. And I really had to look it up because this kind of item, nobody would know about it. Uh, so these are the Munch and Learn, and if you want to have a, a better view or of what is occurring in the future and what is uh, what has been already done, you can have access to our agenda. And I'm pretty sure that either Denise or Matthew will copy paste in the chat or in the Q&A the links to get you there and see all the different sessions that already took place in the in the past. Uh, on another, on the other hand, uh, we also we also host some uh, a different type of uh, of talk, which are called the meetups. We started them back in 2022, if I remember well, and uh, they occur on a monthly basis. And they are more, I would say, uh, in-depth technical type of talk uh, on a given subject. The subject are around open source. It could be also uh, other subjects, uh, development as well, and more. As you can see, uh, the, the agenda for the four coming months is pretty packed. We also have uh, a session in, on the 22nd of February. And if you are a fan of the Lord of the Ring, you will recognize the Galadriel mentioned there, an alternative to uh, an alternative approach to Spire Federation uh, done by Maximiliano Cirici and Max Zembrecht. Followed in March by collaborating at scale with uh, Postman. And finally, in April, Deliver and uh, Divide and Conquer with micro front ends. Uh, so these are the three uh, meetups that will occur over the, the four coming months. Next slide. And again, uh, the, the replays are, are available and uh, the agenda as well will be, uh, the links will be provided by Denise and, and Mathieu in the chat. Uh, the community uh, is made of different assets among which you can find the workshops on demand and I'm the man responsible for this program. So I know a bit about it. So there are around uh, 29 of them, actually. They're all Jupyter Notebooks based. It's free. It's available 24 by 7. It's on the internet. It's available to everyone. So should you be willing to learn about a new technology? Well, this is a place where you can get your hands on some one-on-one -on -one sessions around open source subjects like Ansible, Git, uh, Docker, Kubernetes, and, and many more. Uh, I just had a uh, data, data visualization 101 lately, so you can have a look at it if you want. Uh, and please uh, try them and provide feedback. So in the conclusion notebook that makes the, the workshop, you can find a survey link that takes only a minute or two to fill, and it will help us somehow define the future workshop that you would like to see being created uh, for you. Uh, again, this is a community, so the community is only worth for all the members that it uh, actually uh, contains. So the more member, the better it is for the community in terms of exchange. So we would like you to join and invite others uh, for our talks, the mention and all the meetups. Uh, well, we can join also and subscribe to our monthly newsletter that is summarizing the activities of the group. Uh, of the coming of the past months, I would say. So whether there will be new blogs, new workshops on demand, the agenda for the forthcoming talks, and so on and so forth, events that we should be participating to, and so on. So like any newsletter, you can unsubscribe very easily. So it's up to you. Uh, you can join us on Slack as well. Uh, should you be having some issue with a, you know an API or anything that is programmatically uh, programmatically related, I would say. Uh, there are many, many different channels that you can join and uh, ask the question in there. So it should be related to open source or any HP solution that, uh, that we may have. Finally, if you have more hair and less gray hair than me, you may probably be a Twitter guy. And uh, you can follow us on Twitter. There is a quite big uh, handle there uh, under the name of HP underscore developer. And finally, if you are one of these wonderful SMEs that you have the pleasure to hear about 
uh, in a few seconds. Uh, you can join us and you can work with us to provide us with some blogs. I mean, we have a dedicated CMS environment that is based on GitHub, fairly simply to fairly simple to use. I mean, you just for the repo, uh, create your blog, pull request, and so on and so forth. Anything that uh, shouldn't be that of an issue for you, I would say. Finally, you can also talk and participate to our events and meetups and so on. And you can also, well, join us in any fashion that you may want. So this is a slide summarizing uh, all the different activities and the links. And with no further ado, I will leave the stage to our wonderful speakers and sorry for the issue that we encountered at the very beginning. Floors is all yours now, Scott. So if you wouldn't mind sharing the desktop and take over me, that's all yours now. I will go on mute. Great. Well, thank you for the introduction, Fred, and thank you for hosting the Munch and Learn series. I think this is a really good opportunity for people to, like you said, share our thoughts about <clears throat> what we do here at HPE, where the thought leadership is um, in terms of thinking about how people are using some of the software and where high performance computing is going and how it's being used in a bunch of different areas. Um, Scott and I actually come from fairly similar backgrounds. We're both kind of from the academia side of things and have spent a fair amount of time in academia. So one of the things that we'd like to share with you today is kind of what the view is of high performance computing from the side of the academics who kind of got thrown into this big old thing and without necessarily a lot of formal computer science training and then have had to kind of pick it up through the course of just doing our work. Um, and so one of the really crucial things that we were asked to talk about is this idea of democratization, right? And so We'll, prevent, we'll present some of uh, the first portion of the talk will be kind of going through our own personal views of where HPC fits into scientific research and some of the cultures and norms that have kind of grown out of that. Next slide, please, Scott. And so just to give a quick, very quick biography of uh, where we come from, um, I'll start first and then hand it over to Scott. But for me, I, I have a BA and BS from the University of California, San Diego, both on the physics and AMATH side of things. Um, I definitely did not see myself going into science um, or computer science, actually, from the start when I was first an undergrad. <clears throat> I was primarily interested in, in economics and philosophy and then figuring out how to apply mathematical techniques to both of those things before quickly realizing that I really didn't, wasn't too terribly interested in either of those subjects. And so I jumped straight into physics and AMATH and then uh, decided to pursue a PhD in oceanography, um, which is essentially the physics of the ocean, physics as applied to the ocean. Um, and after that, got really deep into figuring out how to use computers to do these high resolution simulations that we use for weather and climate, um, and especially kind of developing these scientific simulations of the ocean, both from a numerical method standpoint, but then also from a software development and engineering approach. And so as I kind of grew up in my academic career after getting that PhD, one of the things that I became really interested in was combining these two kind of cultures of numerical techniques, numerical methods, especially from the academic side and the emerging kind of machine learning uh, techniques that you know, have caught the attention of the world, not just in the computer science community. And so one of the things I'll touch upon in here in my portion of the talk is how we actually combine those two kind of thought processes, because they have very different philosophies um, that I've come to appreciate the differences are and how we can stitch the two of them together. And then more recently, you know, I actually uh, started here at HPE almost exactly a year ago to the date. Um, but before this, I was actually working with Cray um, starting in about 2017, 2018, before they were acquired by HPE, um, and have really appreciated the role of Cray and HPE in kind of driving some of the hardware and software solutions to doing, to advancing HPC and AI. So this is kind of the role that I'm in right now. I do HPC and AI research. Um, I collaborate with a lot of external partners, and I also am part of a team that um, has an open source software solution that seeks to combine these two things. And I'll hand it over to you, Scott, for your portion. All right. Hey, everyone. So my name is Scott Bachman. Um, I'm a climate scientist at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado, USA. So like Andrew, my formal background is in physical oceanography and applied mathematics. Um, I do climate model development, and I also study turbulence. 
Um, more recently, I've become interested in sort of the computing side of these problems. So how do you handle big data? How do you make your climate simulations run really fast? And of course, this um, aspiration of democratizing science and scientific tools, like basically sharing them with other folks. And for this past six months, I've been a visiting scholar with the Chapel Development Team here at HPE, and I'll be touching on a couple of things related to that too. Oh. Yeah, so to start the talk, Andrew already alluded to it a little bit. Um, we like to share some perspectives of what you know computing and high performance computing and computer science look like from the side of the scientists, both individuals and also the scientific institutions, um, like you know the big governmental labs. And then we'll talk about some specific open source applications such as Smart Sim and uh, Chapel and Arcuda that'll sort of touch on this point of democratization. So to start, I thought it might be interesting to look at my own haphazard background in computing, um, because not only because it's maybe different than a lot of yours, um, but also because it's probably represents what a lot of scientists have in their own backgrounds. So like many American undergraduates, I first got exposed to um, programming in my undergrad at university, and that was just basic C++. And then I really didn't see computing again for about five years until I got to graduate school, where I started using MATLAB um, just for basic scientific problems. Um, I got exposed to HPC for the first time in the context of MPI and OpenMP uh, soon thereafter, just because that's what I happened to be researching at the time. I learned Python around the time when it started percolating into more you know, university settings, um, 2009. And then I kind of stuck with Python and MATLAB for about six years, and that would have been perfectly fine. But then I got my job at NCAR, which is a climate modeling center. Um, you know, we run really massive simulations and work with big data. And so, um, you know, they pretty much exclusively use C and Fortran just for speed. And um, everything since then has sort of been um, revolving around that theme of like, how do you work with big data? So for example, I learned how to use Dask, which is a Python library for big data analysis. And now I'm working with Chapel. But sort of the underlying theme here as, you know, as a scientist is that at any given stage of my career, I only learned the things I needed to learn for my job. Um, and that sort of evolved over time. But that sets the context for some other facts that I'll share about how scientists learn computing and how we view computing. And here's just the brief list. I'll go into each of these points on the subsequent slides. So fun fact number one, scientists' computing skills and comfort level vary dramatically. So here I have a spectrum. On the left, we have what we'll call observationalists. So these are the folks who really like to be out in the field as much as possible. They're the ones who like to go on research cruises, they like to go install seismometers in very remote locations. They probably will never work with HPC in their entire careers. Um, their computing is probably limited to laptop and they probably will use um, commercial software to do their work. But beyond that, um, they don't have the need for the types of solutions that you know maybe we're thinking of here. So. Generally, I'll call them a little bit uncomfortable with computing just because you know they're sort of your average user. On the right end of the spectrum, we have modelers, which is where Andrew and I fall. Um, these are the folks who may work at government labs. Uh, we work with big simulations, big data. Just because that's what we do, we tend to gain a lot more familiarity and comfort with you know big computing and these types of uh, software solutions. And there's obviously sort of a bell curve in the middle. You know, most people fall somewhere in the middle. Um, on the far right extreme, you'd have base people who are basically software engineers who dabble a little bit in science. Um, but again, this is a continuum. And sort of the point I want to drive home here is that, you know, when you're communicating with scientists, you need to adjust your message for the audience, right? The way you talk to people on the right of the spectrum is very different than the way you talk to people on the left. The people on the left may be just interested in what your solution is offering to them, how it'll help them do their work. Whereas the people on the right may actually be interested in the solution itself. You know, how did you design that software? Um, you know, how is it built? So the message has to be adjusted depending on who you're talking to. 
So as an example, um, I also show here where different programming languages um, are used by different types of people. So for example, on the left, we have MATLAB, you know, which is a very standard, um, basically mathematics and physics library that is taught often in the university setting. Um, it would tend to be favored for folks on the left side of the axis just because it's really simple and it presents it in a nice GUI and it's um, pretty well understood. Whereas on the far right, you know, we're starting to talk more about intensive um, computing languages like C, Fortran, um, Dask. And then you see things like Python, which basically covers the entire spectrum up until you get to the far, far right. And also Chapel, right? Because, um, you know, Chapel is sort of aspiring to be a solution that, um, you know, introduces high performance computing to the masses. And, you know, I've been using it and I think it's really appropriate for a wide band of these folks, too. So fun fact number two, scientists are really curious about new computing technologies. Um, you know, we enjoy learning. That's why we're scientists. And we have a, a bad habit of thinking that pretty much everything is really cool and interesting. And, you know, our work is difficult. It can be slow. So we're always looking for ways to do our work faster, better, easier. And you can, you know, you can see the enthusiasm in these folks here on the bottom. But on the flip side, uh, number three, scientists are suspicious about new computing technologies. Why? Because, you know, computing isn't at the core of our job. Our job is science. You know, computing is a tool we use for it. And so anything, any software solution that we have to learn, there's an opportunity cost to that. You know, every hour we spend learning new software, new languages is an hour that we don't spend on science. And so we're naturally very wary of investing time and effort into learning something. And, you know, we're constantly bombarded with potential solutions to our problems, the next big thing. And so we're worried that, you know, is it hype or is your solution legitimate? So one of the outcomes of the skepticism is that, you know, good software solutions often trickle down from specialist to non-specialist. As an example, so in this schematic down at the bottom, in climate science, there's a community called Pangeo, which is essentially a group of specialists who are really concerned with how to handle big data, you know, those terabytes and maybe petabytes of data that we produce by our climate simulations. Those groups may consist of maybe five to 10 people who are absolutely locked into these problems. They think it through as the focus of their scientific research. And they tend to steer the community. So when they come up with a solution or they start playing with stuff, their decisions trickle down into, say, the government labs, meaning your software engineers, your system admins, um, your computing centers. It'll go there first. And then once the uptake is sufficient there, then that'll start trickling down at more of the grassroots level, like university faculty individual scientists, you'll start seeing those things in tutorials and workshops like we are with Dask now. But, you know, it's very rare that new computing technologies start from the grassroots level and percolate upwards. Um, it tends to go always from left to right in this schematic. So another thing, number four, scientists strongly prefer the show in show and tell. And again, this gets back to the point of, is your solution hype or is it legitimate? It helps for scientists to see actual use cases so they can see firsthand where your solution fits into their own work. And so one thing to also think about is that scientists are naturally skeptical. Um, we're literally trained by our academic training to sniff out incomplete or inaccurate solutions. So if you're trying to share something or sell something to a scientist, you know, the burden of proof is on you. You need to show a lot, not just tell them. And so I have this um, pyramid over on the right, which is essentially the pyramid of proof. And I drew that dashed red line as sort of an indicator, like, you know, scientists really need to have confidence that, you know, you're going to be in the upper part of that pyramid. You need to have or show clear evidence um, that your stuff will work and then they'll buy in. And so number five, most scientists are easily waylaid by do-it-yourself software setup. And again, you know, there's a whole spectrum of um, competence that scientists have with regard to computing. But for your average scientist, something as simple as compiling or linking can actually 
um, really set them back. Um, they may not know how to do that. Another thing to consider is that many scientists are at big universities, big um, government labs. They probably don't have admin privileges over their clusters and their familiarity with their clusters is probably limited to like module load. So, you know, as far as making things work, if they don't work out of the box, um, some scientists probably don't even know what's possible on their clusters. Another thing to think about or to keep in mind is that many institutions um, don't have great tech support. So, you know, I know at NCAR, we have a helpline that we can call if we have computing problems, but they may get back to you in a day or two or maybe not at all. Their solutions may not work and that's nothing against them. It's just the truth. And so, um, you know, scientists, because our time is valuable, we just may move on rather than wait for that tech support or that solution to just work. So again, um, it's about presenting a solution to scientists that works easily, gets them going quickly, and then they'll really buy in. And you know, if there is a do-it-yourself step in the schematic here, you're really sort of advertising that to the more competent, comfortable folks on the computing spectrum, meaning you know your modelers. Um, you're kind of you know uh, omitting the folks further to the left. Number six, uh, along those same lines, you know, if your solution works, scientists develop a strong loyalty to it. Again, we want to spend time on science and not software. And if your software works and can get us going easily, um, we'll use it and we'll use it a lot. And even more, we'll actually share it with other scientists and especially our students because we want them to get going quickly. So just as an example, um, you know, this little um, image that I'm sharing down at the bottom is actually a piece of code that is still on my PhD advisor's website 20 years after he wrote it during his PhD. That's that's how long we're talking. So we really, really like to use reuse things that work for us. And we also develop a strong loyalty to languages and programs um, because, again, scientists specialize. Oftentimes, our research programs tend to repeat themselves or at least build upon themselves. There is an amortization aspect to this. You know, if you put in all the effort to learn that language or that software, you're going to keep learning it because it becomes less expensive over time. Another thing is that, you know, when a scientist presented, is presented with a new language or solution, um, it's not totally clear whether that's the right thing for their current problem. Whereas, you know, for the previous solution, they obviously know what it can and cannot do. And so they tend to stick with that. And then scientists are also territorial. Um, we have a feeling of ownership regarding the things that we use. And so, you know, we just tend to keep it. So number eight, the flip side of that, scientists develop inertia against learning new solutions, languages and software. Why? Because, well, that worked before, so it should work again, right? There's the time element, proficiency takes time and our time is precious. precious. Um, and the thing is, you know, it's not like, a scientist can pick up a new language or a new solution in a matter of a week and apply it to their science. You know, cutting edge science requires a decent amount of proficiency in a particular language to actually do your work. And so, you know, that, that time investment can be substantial. And we also ask the question, you know, is this language or is this software really necessary to do this problem? Um, you know, that that's one that it's always ringing around the back of our minds. And so here's another pyramid where, again, I drew that dash red line. Basically, for a scientist to use a language or a piece of software, they need to be good at it and they need to know they're good at it. Um, you know, obviously, you can't expect someone who's new at a language or new at software to be able to use it effectively. Um, they at least have to know what they can do, what the software can do, what their limitations are. And um, yeah, that can take time. So number nine, scientists don't have the bandwidth to seek incremental performance improvements on their own. Again, it's a time issue. And oftentimes we have software engineers available to us who can do it in a matter of minutes rather than us spending hours or days on it. Scientists often don't develop sufficient skill in a language or software to actually improve themselves at it. And so there can be sort of a, uh, a bottleneck there as far as efficiency. And again, for a lot of scientists, um, computer science and technology may be very mysterious to them. They may not be comfortable with it. They may not have the acumen to actually improve. 
So number 10, this one's kind of interesting. So scientists' careers are shaped by the computing solutions that are available to them. So for example, you have two students, one is at a university, one is at a university that has access to a national lab. That student is going to have access to HPC. They're going to have access to a lot of software engineers. They're going to have access to a lot of different problems that are not available to the first student. And so it's a question of like, what kinds of problems are you exposed to? What kinds of programs are you exposed to? What kind of code are you exposed to? What kinds of ideas? So this kind of naturally leads to research and disciplinary silos, which is what we're fighting back, back against in this talk. Um, and the schematic on the right, this is a, a graph of what they call you know, computing index and GDP, but it might as well be a graph of climate science research, um, you know, where it tends to come from. And it's really a function of computing power. You know, a USA pr produces most of it because we have a lot of computing centers um, and so on down the list. So, yeah, I know Andrew and my backgrounds have been heavily shaped by the fact that we have worked at national labs and, um, you know, that, that matters a lot. And number 11, this is the one I'll leave off on, and I'm completely serious about this. Scientists love software engineers because you, you guys literally make everything possible. Um, you know, modern science requires computing to such a heavy degree that nothing would get done without software engineering. So we do have a great, great appreciation for software engineers. Um, you know, everything happens through you guys. And so on that happy note, I will pass it over to Andrew, and I'll be back later. Great. Thanks, Scott. Yeah, so I'm going to shift and zoom out just a little bit. So Scott's been talking about the individual science perspective with some thought to the kind of organizational side of things. Um, and so for my portion of the talk, um, for this section of it, I really want to talk about what happens at the organizational level. And in our title of our talk, this democratization, it implies that there's a movement from somewhere towards democratization. And so the analogy that I really want to use for this is actually um, feudalism, right? Where we have individual places, individual bastions to this era where we have access to scientific uh, high performance computing resources across scientific computing. So uh, next slide, Scott. So to talk about this, I really want to focus uh, on the story and the history in the weather and climate domain, right? So there's actually uh, a really interesting history of this, uh, of weather prediction. It's something that people have wanted to do for a very long time. And actually one of the first computations of weather happened um, by a guy named Richardson, who literally computed the equations the mathematics by hand to do a six hour prediction. Um, he did this while serving uh, as a conscientious objector during the world war and like literally had a notebook where he just had all these computations. Um, that was, this is obviously not something that is scalable if you want to have very, very large computations. And so one of the first applications of digital computing of modern computing age was to actually do these weather predictions on, uh, was to actually do these weather predictions. So numerical simulations for weather specifically stretch back almost to the dawn of what we think of as modern computing, right? So the ENIAC, um, you know, the first numerical weather prediction was run in 1950. And so that's a 70 year legacy for, for that, for this particular application. And, you know, 1950, okay, great. But like, you know, some of the weather and climate models today still contain code that was originally written down in the 1970s, if not even earlier, right? So like we have, when we talk about legacy code, we're talking about a long multi-decadal lineage of this code. And the other thing to kind of recognize too, is that high performance computing and scientific computing kind of grew up hand in hand, right? Like, you know, we had these tools available to us, but the question of how to scale this out, the processes involved, the infrastructure involved, not just on the hardware side and not just on the people side, but also the software side to just actually get these things running. Our concepts and uh, found and foundational pieces that needed to be developed hand in hand as the need and the demand for high performance computing grew. So <clears throat> what you ended up, ended up having uh, was that you had these places because the hardware is very specialized, because the skills were super unique, uh, and the knowledge was highly, highly, um, was highly, highly concentrated. You had a combination of things that led to all this expertise being concentrated in these silos, 
right? As that Scott had alluded to. For me, the analogy is like, these are the feudal states, right? These are the national labs that first had access to high performance computing machines, whether there was something like the ENIAC or whether there was something like the first vector machines um, that were commercially available and largely available. But again, isolated just to a countable number of centers across the world. Next, next slide, please. So kind of going through this and like in my experience, having been involved at a number of national labs um, across a couple of different countries, like one of the things that strikes me, particularly about that experience when I reflect on it, is that there's actually a lot of artifacts from that feudal era where we had these strong isolation of development of HPC in these very particular silos that have kind of carried on to present day, right? So one of the things is that uh, these little fiefdoms, like, you know, whether they were in academia or whether in government, meant that advances in knowledge were shared, because that's kind of like, the that's the currency of the realm, right? Like, you know, oh, my group, my group is putting out so many papers, right? Those papers, those scientific articles are what we get judged on um, in academia and to, to gauge scientific advancement. So you can share that knowledge, but if you don't share the tools, you're actually gaining a competitive advantage over, you know, your other, the other fiefdoms in the area, right? Because like, Okay, well, they have to spend the same time trying to implement the same thing that you did. And so you have a little bit of a lead to there to protect your own little competitive advantage. And so there's a, there's an element of that that kind of carries on to the present day. And then later I'll talk about how that is actually being eroded away by this democratization. Um, and as Scott alluded to, both he and I, um, and this is something that is very, very common across a lot of academia, mean that if you do a postdoc at a national lab or a PhD at a national lab, you can actually become a king. You can make yourself a little king, a little kingdom, because you have access to this very specific code and this very specific knowledge. So, you know, the, even before I would even say the 1990s, right? I mean, like people jumping between that modeling centers, even in weather and climate, was very, very uncommon. And there's so many stories about people who finished their postdocs and then just like saved on floppy disks the source code so that when they became a professor, they could continue that research and build their entire kingdom and their entire career just off of having that access to that code. The other thing that kind of has happened because of the fact that both the, the scientific models, but then also this infrastructure, all the software that has risen up to support the model, they also have very long lineages, right? So it's not just the simulation code that has a 70 year lineage, it's also all the infrastructure around actually running that model, those models, configuring those models, saving those, saving that data, post-processing the data that also have a really long lineage. Um, so this partly means that you have very, very strongly interconnected scientific code and also what we canonically think of as like science or like software engineering infrastructure code. And the other thing that's also really important when you have these really strong lineages is that backwards compatibility is actually something that is very, very heavily emphasized. And this is somewhat counter, I think, to the culture of modern software engineering, where you know if there is a cause to refactor something and you can prove that you can switch to another different tech stack and it'll make it easier, you kind of just do it. Whereas for climate scientists and weather scientists, you know, there is always that thought of like, okay, but like, can I still then run these experiments that have made my career in the past, that have given my my own little kingdom, you know, it's advantage over the other people? Or is that just too high of a cost to bear? Next slide, please. And so again, like, you know, this goes into the era to, to the idea of, okay, well, so from this, from these organizations, from these groups of scientists working together, you know, what are the actual cultural artifacts that still persist to modern day, right? And so one of the things that I think is actually really interesting, and I've heard this in many, many different contexts, is that, uh, you know, because there's such strong lineage, there's actually a huge oral tradition associated with doing climate and weather model development. Um, and to me, this leads to this idea uh, and this critical thinking that needs to be applied that the good ideas of yesterday form the legends of today, right? So there's a lot of things that happen when you're just kind of isolated and siloed that don't necessarily apply to modern day languages because we have stronger and faster iteration on just like software solutions and bugs that get put into the compilers. And so things like programming tricks that people relied on back in the day to increase performance, to get around a compiler bug, to get around a hardware problem, don't necessarily apply to the modern day, but people still take it as writ, as like, as true fact. 
Um, the other thing that's really kind of important about this, and it definitely does persist to modern day, is that because your knowledge and hardware used to be so specialized, that rolling your own or creating your own solution same to something was at that point the only viable way forward. And that still persists to modern day, where you actually see almost every single modeling center has their still has their own infrastructure code. You know, there's very few places, uh, NCAR uh, being one of the places that actually has seen uptake of their infrastructure code being used by a, a number of other different climate models. But still, the instinct is, oh, we have a problem, we're going to solve it ourselves. And that's partly because, you know, of this history of siloing of knowledge and experience. So one of the things that's an interesting one, I think, is the point of debate that I've that I've had amongst software engineers, both within HPE, but then elsewhere, is this question of like, are modern software languages and practices actually needed in weather and climate, right? And this fundamentally comes down to the question of, do they actually match the needs and requirements of the scientific community? A lot of the code, like, like Scott was saying, right, is white right once, used forever. And if you're making an improvement to it, it's usually incremental. It's usually not a complete rewrite. And in fact, that's a feature and not a bug because we need to understand how these things evolve in time. And so we like to do that A-B testing and like to continue doing that A-B testing whenever we develop something new. And lastly, I think that there's a really strong disconnect sometimes between what um, climate and weather scientists think of as legacy and what software engineers think of as legacy. You know, legacy in some ways is almost like a bad word in software engineering because it implies that the code is outdated, you know, it's clunky, it's onerous. But legacy code for us literally means the climate and weather legacy, the history of that, of that code. So it's not just, you know, a practical thing that we're writing, but it also is the essentially the journal of generations of climate and weather scientists before us who have developed um, these climate and weather codes. Next slide, please. Okay, so, you know, this democratization is actually happening. And so if we look at some of the key drivers of this, right, it's the fact that, well, one, open source, so like, there, there are three key factors to this, right? So one is the fact that open source software exists, and then there's a culture uh, that has grown up around it, both in terms of tools and practices that helps us actually accomplish the things that we need to do in science. So these things are, some of these things are like reproducibility, right? Like, scientists really need to be able to say, in order to evaluate critically, be able to reproduce those results. You know, and then we also need some foreign mechanism to share that. And that's something that the open source kind of movement has actually inspired and has now has a mechanism by which we can do that. You know, the other thing is, is that HPC hardware is now available to a lot of other people, right? It used to be that there was a handful of places where you could have access to that hardware, but nowadays, you know, you can afford to do something like rent some time um, in the cloud to actually do a small simulation, or maybe your institution even has at, your institution, or maybe your own smaller department will actually have their own cluster that you can run some things on. And of course, you know there is this the main one that I think is uh, and really interesting is this generational turnover, right? The new reality for all of us coming up in in our PhDs and going through schooling is that we recognize that software engineering is on the equal footing as scientific advancement, right? We have recognized that we cannot do our jobs without some knowledge of computing, of computer science. And then one of the other things is that we have really seen that this legacy, the 70-year-old legacy, uh, means that there's a lot of technical debt and that it's actually impeding our scientific advancement. You know, the other thing that's really, really nice is that, you know, if you only have the same eyes looking at something, you know, one mind can only ask its own questions. And so by opening up our science, opening up our code, you know, we actually both encourage the use of that code, but then also we see the areas where our blind spots are in our code, where the weaknesses are, and where there could be further innovation. And then lastly, like, you know, there's a lot about what we do in the modern software engineering at almost any place that has software engineers, which shows that it does actually lead to higher productivity and mitigates risks like, you know, what if this person left? What if this person who was here for 30 years, their entire career left? Well, we know, we know better ways of capturing that knowledge. We know how to transfer that knowledge. And then we can also onboard new personnel at the same time. One thing I want to point out here are two of the most common uh, on the right-hand side here. These are the Git repositories for two 
uh, the most arguably two of the most commonly used ocean models in the world. Uh, Mom six was one that was probably put on GitHub. I think I don't know six six ish years ago. Whereas Nemo, the one on the bottom, was only really put on Git um, in the past year. And so the thing I want to draw your attention to is that in, is the number of stars, right? So Mom six has one hundred fifty nine stars, whereas Nemo only has twelve stars here, right? And so if you use that as a metric of engagement, you know you can kind of see how even in the like five year interim, you know, Mom Six has had just this huge engagement from people that we never even thought uh, were using it, but apparently are, and are actually improving things and submitting issues and actually contributing back to the ocean model. And Nemo is also moving towards this direction. It has a different organizational uh, organizational um, structure to it, but you know, the benefits of opening it up to the community are really, really important and really and recognized by both of these major modeling groups and consortiums to actually make advancements in the science. Next slide, please, Scott. Okay, so I wanna shift very slightly to AI and ML because I think it really highlights where the differences between these two cultures actually intersect. Um, you know, so one of the things that's really kind of interesting is that there are actually a lot of mismatches between simulation scientists like Scott and myself and AI, right? So one of them is that there's just a fundamentally different approach to solving problems, right? Scientists like ourselves are trained to go from fundamental solution principles to the solution. So part of Scott's work is just sitting down with equations and trying to derive things from it. Whereas machine learning, right, goes from you got enough data and let's just figure out what the relationships are and it gives us the solution. And so those are two very ra radically different ways of approaching the problem. And so in order to even just think about combining these two things, we need to think about just how we marry that disconnect there. And then lastly, uh, or the other, other, the other disconnect is on the hardware side. Um, there's a developer that I know who I think has the greatest quote, which I'll explain, but it's our scientific simulations have the arithmetic intensity of a potato, right? So if you actually think of what we think of as a large scale simulation, this is maybe on the order of, you know, 10,000, 100,000 um, flops, right, you know, per time step. I mean, these things are running for very long periods of time, but in one time step, yeah, maybe, maybe order 100,000 flops. Whereas for a machine learning model, even a modestly sized one, right, the one single inference can cost that entire amount. So we just have vastly different scales at which we're doing these kinds of computations. Um, and so, the question becomes, is the hardware correct for the problem, right? So with the rise of GPU computing and the other accelerators, you know, there's a disconnect there because our computations don't necessarily map onto the modalities that those types of hardware actually um, support. And then last, uh, the second part is that, you know, continuing scientists advancement really is starting to require collaboration among scientists of all flavors. Uh, you know, if you, on the right hand side, there's an article that I found that I thought was actually really interesting, which looked at the percentage of single authored papers, you know, and so before um, in scientific kind of academic lingo, like single author papers used to be much more common, right? This is just one person finding a discovery and publishing into the world. And you can see that there's been this dramatic drop off in the percentage of how many single author papers there have been which suggests the rise of co-authorship, collaboration, and the need to combine specialized areas of knowledge to accomplish, um, you know, to make scientific advancement. And then open source software then is this area where cultures can meet, right? It provides a common language, a common battleground, a common just forum for all of us to start communicating in. You know, we can rely on the community to vet the tools to an extent, like, you know, this goes towards the skepticism what Scott was talking about where, you know, we don't, as individual scientists, can't just trust the black box, but, you know, if there's some engagement, if there's some discussion about the solution, we can start relying on that and not necessarily rely on just our own evaluation to ingest the tool. And then lastly, like, it lowers the barriers to entry, right? And this goes towards a lot of, um, a lot of the fact that we have had to design open source software to be flexible, to be implementable and usable in a wide variety of contexts. And now that's almost one of the you know key founding principles of open source software is having good APIs, is being able to integrate with other packages easily. Next slide, please. 
And so now I want to shift and then just kind of talk about what this democratization has actually meant using uh, a project that Scott and I actually worked on together, along with people from HPE, um, to kind of solve what climate actually, or what we've been able to do in climate because of this collaboration between computer and domain scientists. Next slide, please, Scott. So like I alluded to before, right, there's kind of a missing middle if you're thinking about combining AI, ML, and climate, right? On the left-hand side, you've got machine learning. On the right-hand side, you've got some kind of scientific simulation. And there are these disconnects. There's these mismatches between, between things that actually uh, means that you need something that stitches them together. You need a good binder um, to figure out how to actually communicate across these two things. Um, so if you look at just like some of these things I alluded to, right, like there's just some fundamental differences in the way that we think we need um, to solve problems on the climate side of things and that machine learning engineers actually think about. So whether that's just our fundamental knowledge base, as Scott said, few of us actually have formal training in AI or computer science as part of our PhDs. We may pick them up and we may you know, consult with experts and we may gain proficiency with them, but it's not the thing that we've spent six years of our life trying to learn. Right. Hardware and software, hardware I've kind of touched on before. Um, and then the software languages, right? Like Fortran is the lingua franca, is the common language of climate modeling. Whereas, you know, most machine learning engineers that I know of are like Fortran. I thought that died about 30 years ago. So there's just a fundamental mismatch in terms of how do you get some of these languages to talk to each other. Next slide, please. So uh, one of the projects that we worked on was this uh, was this HPE open source project called SmartSim. Um, and so it's kind of sought to solve this, fill in this gap, this missing middle right there. Um, and really what it actually provides is a way for climate models for legacy code. So that's C, C++, Fortran models to actually call machine learning um, solutions from within the climate, from within the model itself. I mean, it does this through a couple of different ways um, that I won't go into too darling much, but essentially it provides that, that climate model, that legacy code with an inference engine to do all this machine learning work. And then also to do some training as well, if you need to. Um, we enable this by having essentially like a communication client that you can embed into your numerical simulation using, with only minimal changes to the simulation code um, to actually interact with this kind of inference engine and send, in, send data do inferences and retrieve the data back to the simulation. Next slide. And so once we had this kind of solution going, that's great, we got a software solution, but now here's where it comes to the people. And this, I think what really combines Scott's and mine's kind of thesis of our talks, right? Is that, you know, we have to figure out ways of engaging with each other's communities. And so on left-hand side, you have Scott and the NCAR scientists who say, we know climate, We've got our HPE engineers on the right that said, like, we know machine learning. And you've got me in the middle who says, well, maybe I know a little bit about both, but hey, at least I can get you guys to talk to each other and figure out what the kernel is to start talking about. And I think in this collaboration, one of the two life lessons that Scott and I took away from it was that it's crucial to find the people to make these kind of collabor collaborations happen. And that's a matter of them both devoting some of their time, which is valuable and precious, to learn from each other. Like, what are the techniques, methods that you're using? Why would they solve my problem? What are the problems I'm encountering that I might be able to solve for you? How do we get over these divides? Right, and the second one is that nobody has to actually be the expert in everything, right? There needs to be an, as an, an aspect of trust where I have a gap in my knowledge that somebody else in this collaboration will actually cover. And that, yes, you do your own due diligence to make sure that you trust that person, but at the end of the day, right, like nobody needs to be the one that knows everything. Um, but we do need to trust each other and we do need to make sure that the team has all the skills there that actually needs to make the project succeed. Next slide. So when we had this idea of trying to combine simulation and climate, we were like, okay, cool. Like Scott brought the problem to us, we brought the solution, and then we smashed it all together and lo and behold, it actually worked. Um, you know, it actually wasn't that hard because we had talked about what the problem was, what the solutions could be. Um, and so we did one of the first um, demonstrations in the literature of doing online machine learning predictions in a realistic ocean simulation. 
There's a number of studies out there that have been able to demonstrate it kind of on a smaller scale and idealized ways, but we were one of the first to do it at scale um, in a, you know, across thousands and thousands of cores using multiple GPUs and using everything as efficiently as possible. So for this particular study, we ended up doing almost a trillion inferences to simulate 10 simulation years. Um, there was about 12,000 CPU cores that were used and 16 GPUs. Um, and again, that's because we were able to sustain that kind of ratio of CPU to GPU because we were able to kind of use the SmartSim solution to scale the machine learning workload and some resource to match the resources available. I um, mean, then one of the key outcomes of this too was that all the necessary code, the training scripts, you know, the PAC software packages themselves were released as open source. And it is currently being used for that reason by MOM6 users. Uh, next slide, please. So summary for this is that, you know, SmartSim is now one of the quote unquote official solutions for machine learning inside MOM6. Um, you know, one of the things when we were talking with them is that a compatible open source license was critical for acceptance into that. Um, and it's currently gaining interest within the NEMO ocean model community as well, partly because we were able to show, as Scott mentioned, right, that there is this high barrier proof that we were able to meet. And part of that was because of the availability of it being open source. There is also now a larger scale value to the commercial sector. Um, I was recently speaking with one of a client of ours. And when, after kind of explaining what we do and what, uh, what the software solution does, you know, they immediately were like, oh yeah, I didn't actually realize how quickly we'd be able to start using ML inside of their simulations. You know, it used to be this cliff, an insurmountable cliff that people thought wasn't there, but now it is and it's open source and they can start playing around with it today. And I'm conscious of time. So Scott, I'm going to pass it off to you to talk about Chapel and Arcuda. <clears throat> All right. So Andrew gave you an idea about democratization in terms of AI and ML. Now I'll pivot a little bit to talk about it in the context of language and workflows using Chapel and Arcuda as an example. All right. So if any of you were around for the Munch and Learn almost a year ago, that was given by our technical lead, Brad Chamberlain. Um, we talked about Chapel. So Chapel is a programming language that was developed by Cray and now is being developed under the umbrella of HPE. Um, it's a modern parallel programming language that's portable, scalable, open source, collaborative, and its overarching goal is to make general parallel programming far more productive and more efficient for folks like me. So it has this multi-resolution philosophy in that users should be able to get going pretty quickly. So if you're coming from a Python background like, like me, or just like an arbitrary scientist, you should be able to jump in a chapel, be familiar enough with the concepts and syntax to get going pretty quickly and to achieve parallelism without too much work. But it also allows you to dive a little deeper, um, to drop to lower levels of abstraction and milk more performance out of your code if you um, do a little more work. The thing that's really cool about that is that the high level abstractions are built on the low level abstractions, meaning that you know it's you can get your solution you know quickly or you can get it more slowly and more carefully, but you get performance either way. And the reason why I wanted to show this in this democratization topic is that this is really bringing distributed computing to the masses, right? It's like you no longer have to rely on knowing Fortran or C knowing MPI or OpenMP or any of these other libraries, this is a much easier way to get people started um, with HPC and to essentially spread that skill set to more people. And so this really fits in with what we're talking about here. And, you know, anecdotally, I will tell you that Chapel's awesome. Um, I've been using it for the last six months. And just as an example here, I'm showing a fluid flow model that I've been coding up over the last month. It's been very pleasurable. Um, I've enjoyed coding it with it. Um, it's not only easy, but it's also thought provoking. Um, there's a little snippet of code down there in the bottom left. And you know, I can see there's so many ways to take this language and spread it amongst the scientific community. But I'll also play devil's advocate in that, you know, even though these, these types of models are great for showing the power of Chapel, it's not actually how you the way you'd want to communicate with most potential users of Chapel, because very, very few people actually code up things like this. Most scientists, and by most, I mean over 99%, are analyzing data 
not writing these kinds of programs. So my thesis here is that analysis is where you can really start to connect with a lot of people. And so then the question is, how do you take chapel and communicate it with those types of folks? And this is where I wanted to talk about Arcuda. So Arcuda is a library that sort of bridges between Python and chapel. The idea behind it is imagine you have a group of Python programmers, meaning a group of scientists, who also have access to HPC, like this very handsome room of cray clusters. So how do you take your Python programmers and bring them into the chapel world? So the idea behind Arcuda is that you're working with a Python client. So you're coding using a Python interpreter or a Jupyter notebook and you're using Python syntax. But whenever you execute a command, it's actually sending a message over to your cluster and is executing that message using Chapel. And so you as the user are experiencing Python, but in reality, there's a lot of parallel compute going on underneath the surface and you get all that power even though you may not be proximal to the cluster. So here's an example that um, we took a screenshot of my chapel colleague, Ben McDonald's um, screen. So thanks, Ben. So this is showing him sitting at his house on his laptop, connecting with an Arcuda server that's running on Raptor. And so this is exactly what democratized HPC means is that you know no matter where you're sitting, as long as you have access to a computer, you can gain that power of Chapel and that flexibility of Arcuda, um, you know, remotely. And that's that's really cool. So just as a really quick example, here's a very brief demo that I produced a while back. So imagine we're starting up an Arcuda server where here's um, our terminal running on the cluster. And over here, this is my client that I'm going to run. This is on my laptop. And I'm trying to execute this script. So I'm just doing an arc sort. Basically, I have these eight gigabyte files that I want to sort over and over and over again. That's, you know, those are big files relative to the average amount of memory you have on your laptop. But I can take this script, I can execute it in Arcuda, and that whole workflow will actually run on the cluster and it'll just get piped to me, even though I may be sitting at home. And that's really cool. So zoom forward a little bit. So I start executing, it's connecting to our CUDA and off we go. So it's gonna start executing those eight gigabyte reads over on the cluster in a matter of seconds, which of course is impossible on the laptop. And you know that is democratization. That's the kind of thing you wanna spread out to scientists, no matter where they are, which university or where they're sitting. So, yeah, just to summarize the whole talk, you know, we've presented these examples with smart sim in the AI and ML space, Chapel and Arcuda in the language and the workflow space. These are all examples of democratization. And democratization is more than just sharing. It's actually becoming fundamental to progress because, you know, science is becoming more multidisciplinary. It's becoming more open sourced. That's becoming a requirement to move forward. And so some closing remarks, some things to remember, you know, from your seat in industry is that academia is a lot more by nature, open and collaborative than industry. Um, we really frown upon secrecy. We're very suspicious of it. Um, and so, you know, whenever we're presented with a solution that's closed source, we get suspicious of that too. We really need to share and communicate in our on our side of the fence. And so, you know, that's the justification for open source software, for collaboration, and that's the way that you build bridges between academia and HPE. So thank you, everyone. I know we ran a little bit over time, but we're happy to take questions. And uh, I know there may be questions in the Q&A in the chat that I we haven't gotten to, so we can take those now. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Andrew, and thanks, uh, Scott, indeed. Uh, so there has been a few questions and they've already been answered in the chat. There's one remaining, uh, which relates to uh, the fun fact uh, slides. And he was asking where is actually situated Romania in the in the dashboard that you were showing, you know, all the different countries and uh, the amount of uh, and their weight in terms of uh, production and so on. 
and it seems that Romania unfortunately was not uh, displayed in the chart, uh, unfortunately for Patricia, I would say. Uh, I don't know whether if she takes the the URL that was below below the the chart, maybe that uh, it will display some more information there. But uh, if there are any other questions, please, this is the time. And uh, why you can raise your hand and we'll unmute you in this case. And uh, I will bring up the poll uh, right now, just before we leave, uh, because we need to have your uh, your feedback about this session, obviously. So if you can take just a second to, to, to answer the questions. And in the meantime, I will thank, I will thank again uh, Scott and uh, Andrew and emphasize the, the importance of open sourcing. Uh, we are currently actually open sourcing the workshops on demand program, uh, allowing people to reproduce the work that we have done and allowing them to build up a kind of a training center as we have built one uh, out of Ansible playbooks and other stuff. So there are a few blogs uh, that, I'm, that I'm writing currently about it, uh, just to explain everything about, about this. Uh, mm, okay, so there is a question from Eddie Lipman. Is the Arcuda solution planned also for other languages like C++, uh, C Sharp, Java, Swift? Uh, no, it is not. Okay, so that was a short answer. And <laughs> okay, and no plan to make it evolve whatsoever in these other type of languages. No, is not it, not to my not relevant to the the issues that you're facing, I'm pretty sure. No, it's specifically designed to connect just Chapel and Python. Okay, fine then. Any other question in the chat or uh, let me have a look. Okay, no whatsoever. So if not, uh, keep in mind that uh, the replay will be made available uh, in a week or so, give us uh, the time for editing the video and the few recaps that we have at the beginning. Uh, but otherwise, uh, within a week, it should be available on our replay page. And with that being said, I will thank you all for uh, attending this uh, session and, uh, well, having, uh, wishing you a very good end of your day wherever you are in the world. Thanks a lot and have a good day. Bye-bye.